Welcome back to What's New with Mead. We're in episode number 31, and I have a very fun guest from Redstone Meadery here to chat today. I have David Myers, um, who is uh, graciously blessing us with our with his time, and we're so thankful for you, that he's here. Um, David, welcome. Thank you, Garrett. Thanks for having me. So um, if many people have listened to this show and, and know that the general format is getting to know mead makers. When I first started making this podcast, it was uh, me kind of talking into a microphone and that got kind of old pretty fast. And now I, I love to get to talk to you guys and talk to um, people like you, uh, David, about your world. So I want to dive straight into what, um, a little bit of the backstory, the history of Redstone for anybody who's unfamiliar with you guys. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Redstone Meadery, we, we're actually will be on the market for 20 years this, uh, this coming June. So next month on the 21st will be 20, 20 years on the market. Uh, and as a company, we actually pioneered low alcohol carbonated mead, often known as session mead, uh, draft mead, hop mead, our hop meads predate all the hop meads and hop ciders in the marketplace. Uh, so, you know, we've been very fortunate to both be innovative and, you know, we're proud to be an industry leader. And we're also very proud that, you know, we helped kind of set the tone for, uh, for a lot of the American meat industry and, and having companies coming in behind us and following a lot, of, a lot of suit of what we've been doing. Absolutely. And I will say that um, I first found out about you guys because um, I, when I was looking for meteries, of course, you guys being one of the big dogs um, popped up on my radar. But more specifically, here in Oklahoma, we've got weird laws that um, keep mead from really entering in an easy way and so there are not a lot of meaderies that ship to oklahoma and redstone is one of the very few that i was able to get so of my commercial meads to ever try you guys were uh i think you were the second i do believe i went down the trossers route um because somebody i, I saw that and i was like okay I, I guess this is what i have to do and then the next thing i bought was redstone so and we've actually had product on the shelves in oklahoma for, for quite some time i mean well, you know, at least 10 years, probably 12 or 13 years. Yeah. And what I love about that is that you guys do have product on our shelves. Um, aside from you and maybe a small number of other companies, um, there's just not a lot of mead in Oklahoma. So it's very, I'm very fortunate to be able to buy your stuff here. Of course, there is the Vino Shipper route, which I believe you guys are a part of, Correct. Uh, we actually don't use Vino Shipper. We, uh, we okay. handle it all in-house. So you can go to our website. We ship to, uh, you know, 35 or so states, direct ship. Uh, but we actually handle that all uh, in-house. In fact, yeah. during COVID, I, I, I learned how to be the, the, the regular FedEx shipper uh, guy. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Had, uh, slimmed down like a lot of companies did. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, uh, we had intended, of course, I, you had sent me some mead and then I guess it, it didn't, I didn't get a packaging slip on my side saying that I'd missed it. It turned into a whole fiasco, but um, I will, I'll gladly go through the avenues to get that from you this next time. Cause yeah, there, 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 there's at least one really fun meat in that box. So. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was, I was really kind of bummed. Um, but that's, that's a whole nother story. I'm still drinking the meat that we're going to drink. Yes. Somebody has to experience it tonight. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> so, um, Redstone is obviously, it's 20 years is a long time, especially in our mead scene, so to speak. Um, I don't know of many meaderies that have been around, established meaderies that have been around for that long. I do think it's been a homebrew thing, but it's, it's very impressive and very cool to know uh, how long you guys have been creating things. Right. And we actually would, you know, 20 years ago, there were probably about 35 to 40 meaderies in the U.S. whose primary... Uh, product that they manufactured was mead and you know today you're looking at you know in the ballpark of you know 500 yeah which it's a that it's a whole nother topic but comparative to beer or wine we're still small but we are growing rapidly and i think that's super fun yeah you know we're small but we're mighty <laughs> so can you tell me about uh, with 20 years of experience, is there a product that you guys have made from the start that has been your flagship or do you have a flagship now that you would, you'd say? No, absolutely not. We've, our flagship has been the same from day one. It's the first product we put on the marketplace, what, what I'm drinking right now. Uh, and it's our black raspberry nectar. Okay. Uh, I'd say, you know, it, it's the first product I put out onto the market. 
because we have, you know, have bottles and cans and kegs of it. Uh, obviously, keg sales haven't been so good in the last last 14 months. Uh, but, you know, we're seeing that actually revitalizing. And so, yeah, it's it's the number one seller uh, and the first thing we ever made. That's really cool. Um, can you tell me about it? What's your, I don't want to get too nitty gritty, but um, with it being, well, actually, let, let me just get to this next question. I think it'll we'll unpack this, this uh, mystery here in just a moment. Um, so your, that's your flagship. Now, what kind of honey do you guys generally run to for most of your meads? Well, our nectar series. So the black raspberry is part of our nectar series. So we have three distinct product lines. Uh, nectars, 8% and carbonated. Mountain honey wines, 12% and non-carbonated. And our reserve series, which tend to run between 13 and, you know, 14 and a half percent. You know, they vary from batch to batch. And they're the big, heavy, port-like, sherry-style meads. You know, small yeah. sipper. If you're not. Uh, so that's kind of our basic breakdown. We tend to specialize in medium to dry styles as a general rule of thumb. And we have no, no sulfites added. We're always using uh, real ingredients. Our fruits, real spices, nothing's ever artificial, gluten-free uh, as well. So we're virtually good. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then in terms of honey usage, about 95% of our honey is made up of five honeys, uh, from Colorado, clover, alfalfa, and high mountain wildflower. Uh, out of Arizona, orange blossom and desert blossom. I always mm-hmm. describe desert blossom as, you know, kind of, essentially, it's a desert wildflower. So it's a little more mesquite you know, wildflower certainly in Colorado is going to be a little more floral and perfumey. Desert, uh, uh, desert wildflower, more mesquite, a little earthier. And then really after that, so that's 95% of our, uh, of our honey. 75% from Colorado, 20% from Arizona. And then it's, you know, different honeys make different honey wine, like different grapes make different grape wine. So 5% of the honey is, you know, you show us an interesting honey, we'll show you an interesting honey wine. <laughs> yeah, no, I love that. That's really cool. Um, you talking about mesquite. Mesquite is one of my favorite honeys that I, I haven't used it in a while, but man, I, I just love all the um, smokiness to me I get from it. And when I make a boche with the mesquite blossom honey, man, I am, it's, it's just gold. I love that. Yeah. It's a, it, it's a nice honey. And there's, I mean, there are over 300 varietals of honey just in the U S let wow. alone when you start going worldwide. So we actually just put out a, a, a varietal. We rarely do varietal. Uh, but it's, you know, uh, we used all Tupelo honey, and it's brand new meat that just came out last Saturday uh, in the yellow label, the Mountain Honey Wine. Yeah, no, I have a bunch of Tupelo honey that I've been using for things. Also a very nice, um, very nice kind of honey to, to use. Now, I want to uh, flip a little bit, because this is an argument that I don't, uh, everybody has a different opinion on. What strength would you say a hydromel is? Is it uh, from X and below? Well, it, it's kind of changed over time. So we, def- I mean, I coined the term session mm-hmm. and it was defined as 10% or lower. I think through some legislation and some things with the TTB and you're starting to see it in a few states, uh, certainly plenty of people would argue that it's eight and a half. Below. Okay. Uh, and that's, I think, more of a technical. But, you know, 20 years ago when we came out with a low alcohol carbonated meat at 8%, like, you know, nobody's making eight, you know, that low of an alcohol. Now you certainly see, you know, session needs now more tend to run between about five and a half and six. And a half. Okay. So yeah. Well, our low, very low alcohol mead 20 years ago is now kind of like, yeah, it's a little more up there for the session. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's an argument that, and I asked that because the argument itself has that answer. Everybody's got kind of this slightly different opinion and i do think it's all related to the timeline of things like you mentioned um right when they've come in and where their exposure was but when we defined it 20 years ago it was anything 10 percent or above. okay okay and i believe the i I, i'm not positive but i believe uh the mazer cup uh, competition the mazer cup international still defines a session need at uh, 10 percent and lower uh but don't quote me yeah i guess (laughs) yeah But yeah. other than that, it's on video, uh, I do believe it's still defined as 10% or better. Okay. Okay. Interesting. I, I, I like the, um, oh, I wanted to pick your brain about that. So kind of flipping back to where we were, you talked about not using any uh, sulfites. I'm guessing you also don't use any sorbates or are you? We, we wind up stable. 
we do wind up stabilizing our meats because we are going to catch them on the way down. We actually are not in the fermented dry in uh, back Sweden. We're catching it on the way down. So that ultimately allows us to, you know, we need, do need to ultimately use some kind of uh, yeast stabilizer. So with such a massive quantity of mead that you guys make, how do you take, um, let's say, even 100 gallons of mead and virtually halt it prior to drying out? Right. So uh, that would be a small batch. Uh, so our, right, small, right. Our, our smallest batch is, is seven barrels. Okay. Uh, so And then we work in, uh, you know, denominations of seven, 14s, uh, rarely is it 21s. Uh, but then our largest tank are 28 barrel tanks. Most of most of our all of our nectars are produced in 28 barrel tanks. And one of the cool things about using a, a base recipe for the vast majority of our nectars is we make you know we make the base in 28 barrels and then we split it out into sevens based mm. on our needs and our fruiting. Our, our traditionals or our, our traditional needs always made uh, in uh, 28 bar- barrel batches as well. Okay. Uh, in terms of that, but basically you know we're gonna you know we use pasteurization method. So in our case, we're going to heat the kettle up to 180 degrees uh, temperature with just the water inside. We actually shut off the heat. So we never have direct fire on the honey water uh, type of thing. And so after we got that 180 degrees, we started the whirlpool going in the kettle. So the water's just circulating round and round. We uh, uh, built out a grant, so a half barrel keg we cut open, uh, piped it uh, the same as the big kettle. So it's essentially a little kettle. Uh, which was very good starting from mead maker number three. Uh, I was our original mead maker. I wasn't that bright. I used to dump the honey buckets up high into the kettle. Oh, where man. Eventually people got it down low uh, type of thing because, you know, you know I, ain't, I ain't that bright. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, we get all the honey added in. Once all the honey is added in, we now have a resulting temperature of 160 degrees Fahrenheit. Everything's stainless steel, so we hold that temperature for 30 minutes, you know, achieve pasteurization. Uh, after that, it's a very beer-like process. You know, a heat exchanger to cool it off quickly. Uh, oxygen addition help fermentation get started. Transfers into a uh, jacketed-controlled fermenter where the yeast is already waiting. Mm-hmm. Uh, gets everything transferred off. Fermentation obviously gets going. Once we hit our alcohol content, we cold crash it, so we drop the tank into the low 30s, and that gets all the yeast to fall out in, in suspension and drop out of it. After that, we transfer it off. If it's just a traditional, we don't add anything else, of course. For the nectars, uh, you know, we add our fruits, all, you know, all fruit purees, nothing, again, everything's real fruit, real, real spices. Uh, you know, staying on the nectars, that's it now in the cold room, spends a couple of weeks on fruit. Most of the fruit drops out just like the yeast did because it's cold room. Mm-hmm. Use a racking arm to pull the liquid out, leave the fruit byproduct behind. Uh, plate and frame filtration, force CO2 in the package. Uh, when we do the mountain honey wines, because we, it's a stretched out longer period of time, we don't filter those products because there's now more time for things to naturally settle out. But the yellow labels can at times have a little bit of sediment in it, and that's kind of the yeah. Just want to cut it in here real fast and say, if you're enjoying the podcast and want to support the channel, feel free to check out manmademead.com. It's the one-stop shop to find recipes, brewing information, all of the YouTube series, and Amazon affiliate links that support the channel. You can simply click on the links, and when you purchase through that link, it actually, a, a part of the profit goes back to the channel and helps me continue to create content for you all. So I hope you will join me there, and thanks for listening. Back to the show. So you mentioned... Uh, the cold crashing post fermentation. Well, put whenever you're ready to do that. Um, one of my questions is I have, I made the mistake one time of adding a cold crashing a mead, then adding sorbate to it. And right after I pulled it out of cold crashing. And what I noticed was that, um, well, the sorbate didn't really do its job. Didn't get mixed in very well. And it might've been a process of me not racking it or wrecking it right after my point being when it was cold, that sorbate didn't mix in. Are you guys introducing sorbate at uh, 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 what stage in order to make sure that it actually halts? What I'd be interested to hear would be, was it a, a and when you say it didn't mix in well, I mean, could you physically see it not mixed in well? Yeah. Or, hold on, or, or did it not stabilize and it kept fermenting? Can you repeat your question? Right. So, um, you know, you said it didn't mix in well. So my question was, 
I mean, could you see it not mixed in or clumped, or did it just not stop your fermentation so you continued to ferment? It, it did not stop the fermentation. Now, I will admit that I, I stirred it in, and I didn't really closely look because I was like, every time I've stirred it in, it's, it's completely dissolved. No problem. So was it a sweeter mead that it was finished? Yeah. Yes. Right. I, I, I that's, you know, sorbet has, a, I, I think sorbet has a limit to its, to its abilities. Mm -hmm. And so I think if something is still, you know, if there's still a fair amount of sugars in there, you know, you're trying to stop for like a sweet or a very sweet mead, I'm not sure if sorbet is always going to be the, the answer. To your point, it was, I believe it was at like about 1020. Yeah, I would think that would have been a challenge for the sorbet. Yeah. So, well, that was uh, an interesting quandary to me because whenever I, that was an experience of, um, small batch for me, one gallon. <laughs> and uh, I went ahead and bottled that and ended up with carbonation. Accidental, accidental sparkling mead. Yes. And you know, they, they, that's not carbonate. They call that sparkling. <laughs> yes. Yes. And so thankfully, exploding. yes, thankfully did not do that. It, it, um, it was safe. It just was extra carbonated. And um, I, I caught that one specifically after opening a bottle to taste it, test it, I was like, oh, crap. And so I put the other ones in the fridge. So if there's any other chance of more fermentation, then it didn't happen. Yeah, that was a good choice. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's a big recommendation for anybody. If you notice um, unplanned carbonation and it's of a concerning amount, you should probably put the bottles in a cold chamber to halt that fermentation. Right. And, I, you know, as a home brewer... I never did any of those types of things. I mean, I just let the meads run to where they ran. You know, mm -hmm. So some were drier, some were sweeter. You know, just keep transferring it. Be patient. Don't bottle too soon. Uh, you know, and I always said it, you know, to home brewers, it's like, okay, so when you think it's time to bottle, transfer it one more time and take a look. <laughs> just, because yeah. cause the act of transferring can reinvigorate fermentation, mm -hmm. uh, in a, especially in a home brewing set. So, you know, I was like, hey, yeah, when you're definitely sure – Transfer it one more time and wait a few days and see if you see any, you know, see anything a little, a little on top mm -hmm. or, or your airlock gives you any indication. Uh, but yeah, I, you know, to me as a home brewer, I like to just let it go. I mean, if it was too dry, I would add some honey back or I might make a sweeter mead and blend mm -hmm. them together. Certainly if I thought it was too sweet, I'd, I'd repitch yeast and try to get it going. Right. And uh, I, I, luckily that's been one of the very few times I've had unplanned carbonation like that but i'm actually drinking one tonight that's this is a wild yeast mead that because the un unpredictability of yeast uh this one had halted at like 10 12 or something like that and it sat there for like a month and i was like okay it's done it's wild yeast it, it's hit its cap it's good and so i ended up back sweetening it some without doing any stabilizing because i was like hopefully it's done you know this seems seems theoretical and it sat for about an extra week or two. I didn't see any fermentation. And then I bottled it. And I'm sure when I put a little bit of oxygen in that bottling process, those yeast were like, hey, we're awake again. Let's party. Because oh, yeah. it's, like it's, it's a delirium tremens glass you're drinking, you meet up? Yes, it is. Yeah. Right. It's a uh, it's sparkling, um, unplanned sparkling mead. So it worked out. I've had some, I've had some fine home brews that were unplanned uh, sparkling meads. I think one of the funniest ones, you know, because back when I was home brewing, um, you know, at a certain point, I stopped bottling beer and I'd only keg beer because I like the idea of washing one thing. It takes a lot less time. Uh, but meads, I still continue to bottle. And I can remember uh, having an uh, uh, unplanned sparkling mead that I had in some wine bottles with corks. Mm. And like, you know, one day I'm like sitting in the basement, hanging out. And there's like a cork in the middle of the floor. Oh, yeah. And I'm just like, well, how the... Where did this Eventually, I'm like looking at the bottles that were laying on those sides. I'm like, oh, okay, there, there it is. And it, you know, I had one that just shocked the cork out. Um, and that's like a firing really squad. Cool. Give it, yeah. give it time. <laughs> exactly. So the same thing. It's like, well, let's get all those into a fridge someplace. Yeah. So on that point, uh, being a big commercial mead maker, do you do any home mead making at this point, or is all your time spent? commercially, I guess just to say. Yeah, I, I haven't homebrewed in, in, in quite some time. I mean, mm. probably about 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, you know, at, at the time, 
you know, what kind of brought me into it. So I started home brewing beer in the late 80s. I got turned on to meat in the early 90s, uh, actually at Charlie Papazian's house. Uh, so, uh, you know, Charlie, you know, for probably most of your viewers know who Charlie is. You know, Charlie's the guy who wrote, wrote, you know, The Joy of Home. Mm-hmm. He's, he's, the, he's the guru that got the home brewing thing, yeah. as well as he ultimately created the Great American Beer Festival, the World Beer Cup, uh, absolute supporter and, and, and believer in, in the craft industry as well as home brewing. And uh, Charlie's from Boulder. You know, yeah. grew, all, all this stuff started in Boulder. Uh, and we were in the same homebrew club in the early 90s. And in August, we would have an auction that we raised funds for the club. And some of it was, you know, buy tickets, drink at Charlie's house. So I went and you know, I, I bought a ticket to drink beer at Charlie's house. And at the end of the evening, he was just like, hey, you guys want to try something really special? And he pulled out a bottle of his prickly pear mead. Oh. And like, took a couple sips of that. It's like, ooh, I got to make some of this stuff. And so that's how I got started making mead. I'm like, oh, I'm going to make some mead. It made some mead. And, you know, the thing about mead, especially when you are making those sweeter meads, they take, you know, years, really years to, to come, come into in their own. You know, I mean, I used to was making meads at right around year four or five was where they really hit and stride yeah. uh, type of thing. And so I kind of set out because I didn't want every bottle of mead to be sacred mm-hmm. uh, type of thing. I wanted to be able to just open mead a bottle because I felt like opening a bottle. And so I got onto this kick of, okay, I'm, for a number of years, I'm going to make a lot of mead. And then eventually I'll have such a good collection of mead that, you know, I can just open a bottle if I want to open it. And yeah. so that's kind of how it started on this progression of making mead. So I think one year I made like 60 gallons. Then next year I accidentally made 90 gallons. <laughs> um, buddy and I kind of went off on the tangent one day. Yeah. That type of thing. And, you know, like I think we made like 40 gallons in a day and split it up 20 <laughs> and then did it again. And then I made like 60, you know, so I was trying to like basically stockpile. So at one point I had about 30 five-gallon carboys of mead going in my basement. Man, And then that also started kind of this movement of, okay, well, I don't always want to wait for these meads. Or I love these big, sweet, heavy meads that take four to five years to kind of get, get into prime. But what about lighter meads? Can I make something faster? And that's kind of what started this movement to learning how to make nectar. You know, yeah. it, I'm like, oh, I, you know, well, what about a mead that you want to sit out on a deck on a nice summer afternoon? And I started lightening the mead and lightening and using less honey and less honey. I started to see that I thought carbonation would be a benefit. You know, once it started getting a little, uh, uh, and I'm going to use the word thin, but not in a negative way. But it started to get a little thin, a little carbonation adds a little mouthfeel, adds a little, adds a little dance on the tongue. And that's kind of how nectar, you know, got created was it mm-hmm. wasn't like, oh, I'm going to open a commercial meadery. It's I'm doing these things for my own palate, my own pleasure, pleasure of my friends, having things to do. Mm-hmm. And then it kind of morphed because I also had a, a, a lot of background in craft beer, uh, mm-hmm. both home brewing. You know, I was that guy in the late 80s and early 90s when I'd go around the country going, hey, you got any local beer around here? Uh, and, you know, seeking that kind of stuff out. Uh, I worked as a competition assistant manager for the competition side of Great American Beer Festival and World Beer Cup for, for several years. So I mm-hmm. met, you know, all these great brewers who, you know, we now think of as, you know, legendary in the, you know, in, in the industry. You know, I was meeting them when they were, you know, startups and mm-hmm. they were very kind to me and very nice. And I learned from them and got interested. And, you know, that eventually I'm like, well, I could do a brewery, but, you know, I kind of want to do something different. Mm-hmm. I love mead. I felt like mead would have its time. You know, I always say mead comes around like clockwork you know, about every two or 3,000 years. It's in both. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and that was kind of this trajectory from home brewer, uh, beer in the mead, in the exposure to craft industry to, oh, hell, let's start a meadery. Why is yeah. it? How could that not be a good idea 20 years ago uh, t- type of thing? And, you know, we're very, we're very fortunate uh, to be where we are today. Yeah. No, that's incredible. Um, I think that that's like a true story of like home mead maker passion and, and then explosion into the big scene of it. I think that's, that's super cool. Uh, you'd mentioned about, hold on, I had it. Uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry. You had, you'd mentioned about the lighter ABV in that experimentation. You noticed it becoming thin, as you, you said. Um, I think it, not in a ne- I don't use the word thin in a negative connotation. No. And I, and I understand what you're saying. There comes a point. Small body about that yeah 
Well, and there, there comes a point where um, I tried to experiment one time with a, it was like a 6% non carbonated, non sparkling um, boche, which I learned, I feel like I learned two things from that experience was a super light ABV boche was kind of funky to me. I couldn't, I didn't quite enjoy that. But two, it being non carbonated, um, made it feel without any adjustments, watery or extra thin. And that could have been um, the combination of ingredients I was using or whatever, but I, I perceived that uh, mead as thin and not a positive way for me. So that carbonation you're talking about is, uh, I feel like it's a great method to employ for, for building up the body and the mouthfeel of a mead without adding a bunch of things. Right. Uh, CO2 has flavor. Mm -hmm. you no, know, and, and it's not just flavor, but it's a, you know, creates a little bit of a bite. And yeah. right, I think a small body, I feel like I'm eventually start referring to the meads as petite, but, um, <laughs> you know, but, you know, but CO2 does add a little bit uh, of characteristic that I think helps with those smaller bodied uh, meads. And that's why, you know, we, de you know, we developed it that way uh, because it's like, okay, but this is a little lacking, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like when I made the first light, one, I was like, and, and I, I, I mean, water, I think is a reasonable, reasonable comment to it. Again, it's, it's like, it's missing something. Yeah. It needed something. Yeah. And CO2 is at least what we felt like, uh, kind, kind of brought it back up into like, wow, this is really good. This is very refreshing. It's very easy drinking. Yeah. Do you, so do you guys make, uh, a traditional, session mead at this point or are you guys doing namely fruited things you know it's, it's funny we, we don't so the the simple answer is no we do not have a, a traditional nectar uh mm -hmm. which you know one of these days i'm sure we'll do it mm -hmm. when we started 20 years ago you could not make such a thing ttb mm -hmm. you know back then it was alcohol tobacco and firearms before all that changed around you had to have a certain starting uh, bricks to have it be honey one. Oh, okay. And so when I first actually opened that, I was looking to do that and I kind of bumped into like, wow, you're not allowed, actually allowed to do that. And when I was still getting my license and going through everything, uh, a, a, a person from the ATF was actually saying, you know, it's actually a really good time to put in a petition for something like this because we're, we're, we're reviewing any number of rules and regulations. And it, it's actually, you know, it would be a good time. And so I'm like, okay, you know, then I had nothing else to do. I was opening a meadery. So there wasn't, it wasn't like I was busy actually, in fact, 20 years ago. So I put in this petition to the ATF to, uh, you know, to lower the starting bricks uh, uh -huh. for a, uh, you know, for uh, just a, you know, traditional meter, just not. And like, yeah, I didn't think anything of it. And at that point, I'm like, okay, well, I guess, you know, we'll, you know, black raspberry is always going to be something what we did. But, you know, we not, didn't think much about it. After. We just went along our merry way doing what we were doing. And it might have been like three, four, five years later, like I got a letter being like, oh, we, we've, we've passed your petition. Oh. And I actually had to be like, what petition? <laughs> I, I can't even really remember. I'm like, uh, what did I put in? And it's like, yeah, oh, they lowered the starting uh, bricks levels for 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 honey wine. Wow, that kind of thing. Uh, and it's funny because we've never really quite come back to it. Uh, mm -hmm. Our sunshine nectar, which is a hint of apricot, uh, the apricots kind of have honey flavor anyway, so that's kind of in the carbonated one the closest. So we're not not doing it. We just haven't done. It. Well, and I, I wondered because. Fruited meads obviously use fruit, which skins or the fruit themselves have tannic value, mouthfeel, body elements that are added. So I feel like when you're playing with just honey, water, yeast, uh, it's hard to fill out that body with anything, well, without um, putting extra stuff in to that are, that's, uh, I don't want to say not real stuff like maltodextrin or anything else that's like powder that people don't necessarily like. Right. I mean, we certainly would never go that route uh, in terms of that. But I think if you're going to make a session traditional, and I'm sure people have, I can't imagine it's not out there. I think certainly the key would be a very flavorful honey. Mm -hmm. And a little bit of back sweetening, I feel like could with honey itself, 
assuming you're not bottle conditioning, would definitely, uh, at least to me, help fill some of that out. Yeah, and, and, it, and it could well. And even like the Tupelo uh, Rado that we have in our higher alcohol version right now, you know, we had a tough time debating, like, do we make it into the Mountain Honey Wine or do we make it into the Nectar? And mm-hmm. we certainly thought it was a honey that could play into the Nectar, uh, but for varying reasons, you know, we decided to take it into the uh, – into the higher alcohol content. Well, that's that's fascinating. I love that you're like, wait, I didn't, I made a petition. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's just. It, re- it really was. And then, you know, it's funny because like, I don't know, like 50 or 16 years later, uh, the uh, American Mead Makers Association kind of approached me because they wanted to do some petition and stuff like, well, mm-hmm. you've had success. I'm like, you think I really remember what I did like 15 years ago <laughs> to, to get that? I'm like, they just told me to put it in. I wrote it up, I sent it in, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I just did what the person on the other line, the other side of the phone, told me to do. That's that's incredible how long it took for it to pass through. <laughs> yeah, it that's... was. Like I said it, it was certainly at least three years. It might have been four or five. That's why I was yeah. like, "What petition?" Yeah, yeah, that's quite some time. Okay, so I want to talk to you guys, to you about the your um, yeast choices mm-hmm. and kind of other things within that fermentation process. So we we talked about um, you talked about using a uh, base a base for most of your meads making what I assume is just a, you know, 600 gallon batch of something. And then you split it up into your barrels and then you put your uh, flavorings. Um, So uh, I, that answers my question of if you'd like to do use primary or secondary fermentation or really, I guess at that point, uh, I don't even, what stage would that be since you're stabilizing? So we actually, there is no secondary fermentation in our production. Yeah. Primary, And we have condition. Okay. Uh, but in terms of yeast uh, selection, so all of our nectars we're using a Narbonne yeast strain. Mm-hmm. Narbonne tends to be described as good for young fruity wines, which is a pretty accurate description of our nectars. Uh, but even that, when I was still home growing and kind of beginning to do, actually doing test batches, heading towards the meadery in the in the nectar series, uh, you know, what we were we were using ale yeast. Mm-hmm. when we were doing those experimentations. Yeah. I can actually remember having a lot of fun doing, you know, making up a five-gallon batch and breaking it into one-gallon, uh, uh, condi- you know, uh, uh, carboys, not carboys, by, by an apple juice drug, uh, yeah. and using five different yeasts. And it was mm-hmm. amazing, the differential uh, type of thing. As a home brewer for ale yeast, I was always a big fan of 1020, uh, what was it, 1021 is the English ale yeast. Uh-huh. Uh, memory yeah. might be failing me. For, for the numbers after all these years. Uh, but you know, especially then, it's kind of before I moved to becoming a much more hoppy guy. So, yeah, I love the, I love the English ales uh, yeah. in, my, in my earlier days of home brewing, even though I've gotten more of a, a hop configuration for my drinking. Uh-huh. Uh, but, you know, I love the English ale. One of the funnest ones was, you know, I pitched in a Belgian beer yeast into one of them, and it's like, hmm. wow, that's really good. It's like, but everybody kind of agreed, like, you're going to try and make mead, and nobody knows what mead is. You probably shouldn't lead with this. Now, of course, there are a lot of funky now mm-hmm. Belgian yeah. uh, meads out in the marketplace and, thing, and things have moved. But, you know, I would have thought I would have been using the, you know, a, a ale yeast uh, when I got started. And I had also, also been doing some reading up on yeast and I came across mm-hmm. this Narbonne. And I literally, I made two seven barrel batches same day. Mm-hmm. I threw the Narbonne in one. I threw probably the English ale 1021 uh, yeah. ale yeast in the other. I let them ferment, and when they were done, and I fit, you know, I threw it in them. I did the whole whole bit. I took uh, what is now the Brewers Association. Back then, it was the Association of Brewers, mm-hmm. also a Boulder based company. Uh, had lots of friends who worked there uh, at the time, still do. And I basically went in from office to office with a sample of each, like which one you like, which one you like, yeah. which one you like. And overwhelmingly, everybody pointed to the Narbonne one. Okay. It also uh, uh, performed better. Fermentation was faster. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, all right, well, I guess I'm using my bone. Yeah. Um, you know, I like not having barriers. I just kind of go the simple route in my decision. So that's how Narbonne became the nectars. Uh, as a home brewer, I always loved Montrachet. Oh, okay. I kind of feel like Montrachet is kind of a yeast strain that it's got its lovers and it's got its haters mm-hmm. uh, type, of, type thing. But I always loved that yeast. You know, and I worked, you know, I fermented with sherry yeast and champagne yeast and lots of different wine yeast. There's something about Montrachet that just always appealed to my personal palate. 
So the mountain honey wines, the 12%, all have Montrachet for their yeast strain. And then our reserve series, we use a series of yeasts for those. Okay. So um, have you ever, in home brewing time, or I guess in commercial time either, experimented with multiple yeasts in a batch, or have you always stuck to one, even if it was just a... So on the commercial level, again, our reserves, we are using more than one yeast. Okay. Um, oddly enough, I keep referring to it as various yeasts and more than one. It's about one of the few things we don't quite talk about. Mm-hmm. Uh, as a home brewer, absolutely. Uh, you know, I would, you know, like, oh, two Montrachets and a Champagne. Uh, yeah. A Sherry and, and a Montrachet and something else. And uh-huh. I think definitely, you know, and it's not like I'm doing them in stages. It's like, oh, yeah, throw it all in there. Yeah. Right, were, you know, and I, you know, it, as a home brewer, you know, I started home brewing beer in 1989. Mm-hmm. Now, there weren't really any home brew shops. Charlie's book was a pamphlet. Uh, there was an old timer in uh, Boulder who sold home brew supplies out of the back, uh, back of his house, Colonel John. <laughs> you go to Colonel John's yeah. house and go in the back. Nothing had, no, nothing had stickers, you know, for, for how much it costs. And you uh-huh. literally could buy the same set of ingredients three days, you know, three days apart from each other and pay a different amount of money. And I just started trying to, you know, brew. I mean, back then, you got to remember, it wasn't really craft beer. I mean, there was a little bit out there. Sam Adams was already going. Uh, Pete's Wicket's going. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, if you're on the West Coast, you got Anchor, you got Sierra. Uh, you know, you got little pockets here and there, but not much. And, you know, we were just trying to brew better, stronger, cheaper. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, that was, you know, I mean, I'm, 23 years old, better, stronger, cheaper uh-huh. uh, type of thing. And that's kind of what started it and in, in, in getting interested in it. And the colonel was always kind of an interesting guy because, you know, you would ask the colonel because you're trying to learn, like, hey, colonel, I'm making an English brown ale. What kind of hop should I use? The colonel's answer was always the same. Well, you can use whatever you want to use. It just depends <laughs> what you're like. And as a new home brewer, this felt like useless information. Right. But as I continue to grow and now even further more getting into, you know, as a commercial guy, looking back or talking to home brewers a lot, I discovered the wisdom in what the colonel was saying, because a lot of times I find myself answering, well, you know, I'll just answer what you like. You can do anything you want to do. Uh-huh. And, you know, I always say the weirder the idea, make it a smaller batch the, the first time out. Mm-hmm. You know, because that, that's kind of like, well, that might be a little strange. I might only do it like a two gallon batch of that. Don't go five. Uh, but, you know, we tried weird things. We tried different things. I made, I made a roasted garlic meat once uh, that uh, very garlicky. Uh, I put it into <laughs> wow. a home brew. I put it into a home, uh, the local, uh, my local homebrew uh, club back then, Hot Barley and the Ailers. I put it in, and of course, it went in as a melamel, a vegetable or, or fruit. And I didn't win anything with it, but I got a lot of comments uh, type of thing. And the funny thing was, I was hoping that they would taste mine first before they tasted all the fruit it needs. So I completely and totally spoiled their palate. And everything would just taste like garlic after that. Be like, hey, that garlic meat was really good. Uh, yeah. You know, and, you know, just cracked uh, uh, black and red and white peppers. And, uh, you know, and it really is. That's the beauty of homebrewing. That's the thing I really always, you know, loved about homebrewing is you can try anything you want to try. You can be, you know, into I want to hit the styles. And that's great for people who want to hit the styles. Uh, mm-hmm. I was not that guy. I was making better, stronger, cheaper, um, and just letting her go. And she went where she went. Most of them came out pretty good. There were certainly some duds. Uh, it's the other thing I loved about meat is a home brew. You know, if you don't like what you have, meat is the most adjustable product, fermentation product. Mm-hmm. You know, if it's too dry, add some honey. If it's too sweet, add some yeast. If it's got a little woo, put in, dump a bunch of fruit in there. Uh-huh. And that was, you know, the beautiful thing uh, for it. So, you know, I was... I was a fan. I was a fan of, of, you know, back then, of course, micro, now craft industry uh, type of thing. And that's how I got into what I was doing uh, t- type of thing. Uh, and, you know, it's, you know, it's obviously a very different world out there because uh, you, you can buy less expensive, strong, tasty beer, tasty mm-hmm. meat, tasty ciders, tasty, you know, whatever you want kind of thing. Uh, but, you know, back then we were just, we were just having fun and you know, doing what we did. And, you know, again, very fortunate that one thing led to another. And you know, here I am yeah. 20 years later in, in biz. Well, and I think your persistence and it seems like to me your 
experimentation and testing of recipes is, is probably what got you to develop your palate as well as you have currently. Um, and I kind of have a question about that. Uh, within that time, um, making meads and making garlic meads and stuff like that, would you, uh, uh, is there any advice you'd give to people who are desiring to develop their palate? Is it simply just to make more mead or is there a secret that you feel like you found? No, I, I think it's make more mead, make more different mead, drink more mead, drink other people's meads, not just your uh -huh. mead, uh, whether that's homebrew or commercial. Well, I make it commercial and drink my meads. <laughs> uh, but no, I think that I think it's like most things in life. There's no substitute for experiencing more things. Mm -hmm. You know, and it doesn't really matter what you're doing. Uh, but, you know, trying to branch out further uh, and, and maybe, you know, try to make something like, well, in theory, I wouldn't like this. But, you know, I added this weird ingredient or I don't really like dry meat, but I made a dry meat. Well, mm -hmm. maybe I can make a dry meat I would like. Yeah. That type of thing. And I think that's, you know, kind of part and piece of it. So I think there, there's no there's nothing more important than developing in developing your palate and trying more things. Absolutely. No. And I, that's one thing I always want to point people to when they start making mead is to also parallel to that is to try meads like you're suggesting. And, and I think that's where I've learned the most. Um, of course, making mead myself has helped me understand what I like and I don't like, but making, not making, trying mead from uh, people who are selling it, which theoretically, if you're selling it, it you're putting out a, a fantastic product. No, I, I, I couldn't disagree with that more. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, well, I don't mean that way, but you know, we've all had beers we don't like. We all have yeah. meads we don't like, ciders. You know, unfortunately, there are people putting out less than quality product for whatever reason. Now, I'm not knocking it, or I mean, that's yeah. that's. I mean, you know, there's bad bread. Uh, you know, it's not not those types of things, but you know, yeah, it's just going going out and trying different things. There's also a difference between that's well made, and I don't like it. Mm. You know, and, and I think that's one difference that sometimes people are like, well, that's not a, that's not a good mead. Well, is, is it not a good mead or do you just not like it? But it's technically like, well, no, that's well produced. It's clean. It has flavor. It has it might just not be a flavor that that you you happen to enjoy. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the old thing. And, you know, I mean, to a certain extent, good is what you like. Yeah, no, actually, it's funny you say that because I was. Uh, taste testing one of my meads that I made the other day. And um, I said, you know, this will, will make the biggest difference to you as the person watching this is if you will either A, attempt to make this mead with the exact recipe I've done or a very similar recipe and tweak it a little bit. But hearing someone talk about a mead uh, is valuable. You gain information, you understand how to the vocabulary that goes in behind tasting, but really experiencing the uh, the garlicky taste in the mead or the the papaya you get from something is more important. So I, I always emphasize to people to just just try it, like you suggested, try to make things you don't necessarily know will work, and then of course make things that you want to make as a standard in your house. And I think the other thing about mead is you got to be patient as a home brewer you got to be patient so you obviously if you're already making beer and you get into mead i always joke with home brewers oh you're going to start making mead buy another carboy because you're about to tie one up for a while yeah uh, and mead is an interesting thing where you know you could taste it at six months or nine months or 12 months and be like yeah and i always say so ignore it <laughs> yeah. leave it alone just don't don't be like oh yeah that didn't come out so good we'll just drink it up or i'll dump it or whatever because in that mead, you may have not been that thrilled at at six or nine or 10 or 12 months old. You know, suddenly, you know, you might taste it at like 14 months. And, and I always talk about mead, like, especially again on a home brewing level. Mm -hmm. uh, one day, sometimes mead just turns a corner. Yeah. And suddenly you're like, yeah, that, <laughs> there it is. And if you've been impatient, you're in your last bottle when it gets there. And there's nothing worse than you, you finally have a good mead on your hands or a great mead. You're uh, like, oh, crap, it's the last bottle. I got two bottles left. I mean, and even on a commercial level where it doesn't quite happen as much for us, 
because we're a little more dialed in. We have the professional equipment and that. But, you know, I feel like it's an advertisement for my Tupelo uh, Mountain Honey Wine. But the Tupelo is actually a great example. When we tasted it at, you know, I mean, we put out our 12 percenters, you know, anywhere from six to 10 months old is roughly when they're coming to market. They definitely mm-hmm. age well. And I happen to be a fan of more aged mead. And when mm-hmm. we're up on our inventories, we're, you know, we're releasing stuff that's older. But, you know, you got to deal with ebbs and flows of commercial uh, releases and such. But the Tupelo, it like, you know, when we bottled it when it was six or maybe even, you know, eight, eight months old, it's like, yeah, it's fine. But it wasn't like we weren't like, wow, or anything yeah. like that. It was like, yeah, you know, I mean, it's good. You know? And then, you know, it went into the warehouse and it's been, you know, kind of sitting. And, you know, when we tasted it again, and at that point, it's, you know, probably, you know, 12, you know, you know, 12 months old. And it's like, yeah, this kind of, wow, that's better than I remember from the last uh-huh. time. Just looking at the days on, on, the, on my uh, production. And then, you know, and then we got another time because we were going to put it into a comp. We hadn't released it yet, but we we're putting it into a comp. So it's like, hey, wow, you know, that's – and the reality is, is then we just released it. But when we drank a bottle of it a week ago, yeah, probably a little over a week ago, suddenly it's like – I'm going to finally work the word fuck into our you – know, <laughs> I'm like, you know, this is really fucking good. Yeah. And it was amazing to watch that progression of where we were like, yeah, you know, yeah see where it goes and sometimes you just have to let it sit mm-hmm. and and again most of our meat were dialed in but we will get occasionally and we've seen this especially in honey only products uh we did a zambian uh, uh traditional meat also uh-huh. with honey all from zambia uh and it was it was actually the same thing it was like eh, yeah, mm, damn uh yeah. over time so like the, the tupelo uh was made in september of 2019 so it you know it's 18, 19, 20 months old, you know, 19 months old mm-hmm. now. And it really was until about last week. We're like, yep, let's release that. Yeah. Uh, that thing. And when you're doing the limited edition stuff, you can sit on them more. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's a nice thing. You know, I feel like, you know, let me, since I'm advertising so much, so try the yeah. damn Tupelo. You can get it on the website coming to a store near you. Uh, yeah. But, you know, it, but it is, but as a home brewer, I often experience that mm-hmm. where you got to be patient. You know, I always joke, I saved my allowance as a kid. So I was made for me, uh-huh. uh, type of thing. Because you got to, you know, when people go, do you have any pieces of advice? Like the three first pieces of advice I have when you're making meat at home is patience, patience, patience. Hello, podcast listeners and watchers. If you are enjoying this podcast, check out my Patreon. It is patreon.com slash manmade mead. For two bucks a month or more, if you want to support the channel more, you can gain exclusive access and early access to all of my videos. You can also support the channel, help me create new content, and rest easy knowing that I am able to do more with this mead community. I hope that you enjoy this podcast and I hope you will come and support me on Patreon if you'd like even more mead content. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I, um, when I first started, arguably not long ago in the grand scheme of things, that was one thing people said is, um, you know, you need to, it, it was really a standard. It was, people said you shouldn't drink a mead until it's six, nine, 12 months old. Now, um, I do agree to your point that age makes a mead great, but the lower ABV stuff, like, you know, your 8%, 9% session stuff probably doesn't take as much time sometimes. What well, we can, we'll kettle the shelf. We're looking at about two and a half to three months. Yeah. Now again, because meat ages, well, we can overproduce. So sometimes they're coming out a little older and even age is one of those things that that's, that's, that's a palate pressure. So, you know, age also is a flavor. CO2 is a flavor. Aging is a flavor. And, you know, I happen to like personally the flavor of aging. You know, I like it in my Belgian beers. I like it in my barley wines. I like it, you know, in in imperial stouts. But, you know, other people like things fresher tasting. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I always like to say where I like my mead best and where you like my mead best might be very different places based on our own palates. Yeah. One of my favorite... um... I've got lots of little YouTube series, but one of my favorite ones I do is with my friend um, doing the most, who's another mead YouTuber, but it's called palate expanders. And we both bring a bottle of mead and we taste test them without telling each other what we've brought. 
And the whole point of it is to talk about the tasting process and use the vocabulary, but also to see how true we are with our, our meads. And so, you know, lots of times I'll bring something and it's supposed to be whatever, uh, apple and, and pear. And he's like, and he never says the word apple or pear in it. And I go, well, crap. I obviously I'm not accomplishing the things I want, but just the experience of, uh, having someone else taste your mead, and of course, for me, at least doing the blind taste test has helped me develop my palate to uh, feel more confident, but also to totally shoot down my confidence because there are times where <laughs> I miss the mark. But also keep in mind with the mead, since honey is being, you know, comes from something being pollinated. Yeah. You know, maybe there were some apple characteristics or some pear characteristics. So, you know, there are a lot of flavors that can come out in honeys themselves uh-huh. where it's like, well, it's not. You know, that fruit is not there. I didn't put that fruit in it, but some, you know, configurations of the honey itself might give the appearance of some of those flavor profiles. That's true. That's true. Um, I love getting to experience different honey varietals. I have a bunch of honey in the other room that I'm just, I can't wait to use. So that brings me to my next question, which is uh, in your time home brewing and commercial mead making, is there something you've always wanted to make, but never had the chance to make? Yeah, not really at this point. I mean, if I want to make it, I'm going to make it. So I mean, yeah. I can find the ingredients. You know, we did have a number of years ago, I kept bumping into this honey in like little farmers markets, varying parts of the country you know, called meadow foam. Mm, yes. And meadow yes. foam is like really creamy, a little vanilla. Uh, you know, and I keep bumping into this honey. I'm like, damn, I love this honey. And of course I would ask for it. So I'm like, okay, oh, I get this in bulk. And they're like, what do you mean in bulk? I'm like, well, Probably the smallest amount I need of it would be like 300 pounds. And like, ah, no. Yeah. And I, and I keep, again, this went on for years. And I, I was actually doing a, a, an article, being interviewed for an article by the Denver Post. And it was a long, long time ago. And uh, the reporter kind of asked a similar question. He thought, honey, you've always wanted to work with, uh-huh. but you've never been able to. And I went off on this tangent about meadow foam. And like six months later, she calls me up. She's like, I found you your meadow bar. <laughs> she had a sister in Oregon oh. who had a friend who was a beekeeper, and he had meadow foam honey in bulk. Hey. So I got to work with this meadow foam honey, and it went into our peach reserve uh, from 2011. And it was kind of because it had very creamy uh, aspects. It has a very like peaches and cream thing going on. That's cool. Uh, and all of our reserves have three different honeys in them. Uh, the, the nectars in the mountain honey wines, we always, with the exception of when we do a varietal, we always use two honeys in mm-hmm. the production because I like to meld multiple flavors into our own unique flavor yeah. uh, type of thing. So, but for meat itself that I've always wanted to make, it's like, you know, at this point, yeah, if I can get the ingredients, yeah, I'll yeah. make it. So that, that uh, meadow foam is, I've used it a couple of times. And to me, it gives off a very, I, I use the word fake sugar, but what I'm really referring to is like cotton candy, marshmallowy. Yeah, that's that know. creamy. Absolutely, those are the flavor profiles. So you have to use it in balance with other honeys. Yeah, like, just like it's a little delicate make, too. Yeah, you don't want to make like an all buckwheat honey uh, uh, <laughs> necessarily. That's funny you say that because I I've done that, made a buckwheat traditional, and holy cow, it's like yeah. getting kicked in the face by a horse. That's what it feels yeah, like. That's, yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> You don't want to make 100% buckwheat. I'm sure someone makes a really good one, but that's, uh, that's and I love buckwheat honey, and it can be great used in, in, in small blending with other yeah. honey for characteristic and depth and color and those types of things. But, uh, but yeah, it, it, it can be a bit much of the whole one. I've, so you're talking about using multiple honeys. I did my first, uh, I've used two honeys before to you know balance each other, like you're saying, but I did my first three honey mead the other day and it was uh buckwheat um clover and blackberry and it was proportions were like um two pounds of blackberry one pound of clover and then a half a pound of buckwheat because obviously buckwheat is strong and i wanted to balance it turned out amazing and i was it's made me really fired up to start mixing honeys to see what kind of uh things i can create because it it's great yeah no it actually sounds like a delightful combination Mm mm-hmm so I am all about that. I think if anybody's listening, go try to mix some honeys um, and see what you get because you'd be surprised. So you, you've, let's, uh, I mean, 
being able to make all the meads you want is pretty cool. <laughs> Just to be able to say, okay, I want to do this. Let's do it. I love that. Um, my next question is, is referring to mead styles. So I'm a firm believer that the hardest mead style to make would be just a straight up traditional um, because of the, how much you're depending on the honey character to drive that mead. Um, do you have a specific mead style that you would say is most difficult to master quote? But, I mean, again, we've been at it a long time. So I don't think of any mead being harder to make than any other, but you know, making a traditional, it's kind of like making a Pilsner. Ain't no place to hide. Yeah. Uh, type of thing. And so, you know, that, so I agree with your assessment that a traditional meat is the hardest meat to make uh, because mm -hmm. any, any flaws are going to show much, much uh, brighter, uh, which is why then you turn it into a mellow mel 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, type of thing. So yeah, absolutely. Anything that's in its most pure sense. And that's same with the Pilsner. Anything's a little bit off in the Pilsner. It ain't going to be good. Well, I think a dry traditional, especially um, would be tough. And just because the age, I feel like every single dry traditional meat I've ever tried to make has taken so much time to get to that melding point where the alcohol and the dryness are not um, just killing me. Now, granted, I have only been meat making for a few years now, so I can't say that I've, I've done it all. But that's just my little short-term experience um, waiting for a traditional, uh, dry traditional meat to get to the point where I want it to be. Yeah, I mean, dry, the drier the mead, the harder it is because you definitely, you know, you you got in your alcohol content, but the drier it is, the less flavor you have because you converted your your, your one flavor product into uh, in, into alcohol. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, especially as a tradition. Obviously, you can take a dry mead and then add fruit, and that gives you a little more texture and, and balance and flavor. Absolutely, and that's just I always like to ask people that because. Um, some people find more difficulties with various styles of mead. You know, like I know some, um, uh, one of my friends, BC, who's, who's doing the most, has been experimenting for about a year to two years now with an Acer Glen recipe. And he's done it a m bunch of different ways. And he's found that it's also a, an interestingly tough uh, style of mead to, to make great because you're, uh, balancing so many things. Maple syrup, I love using maple syrup, but it does add some extra variable that's different. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, now my, this is kind of my last question and then I'll let you go. I know you're, you're probably ready to go home. You're almost, it's almost Friday. So <laughs> I'm sure you're ready to wrap up your day. So my, my last question for you is what, um, is there anything in the Redstone Meadery world uh, aside from your newest product that we should be looking out for that what's what's the next big thing for redstone um i mean we're always you know we have our regular national product lineup and then we have a bigger lineup in colorado itself which kind of seeps out in the different parts of the country uh you know we've been doing a lot of barrel aging uh products so we try to keep a regular uh barrel aged traditional version up uh we're actually just finishing up our tequila barrel aged version uh, and the next barrel aged version after that will be the first time we've done a single malt barrel oh. aged uh, traditional. So we're excited okay. about that. Uh, we also have uh, another new product that will be out probably in the next month or two. First time we did it, it's called Pine Go. And it's pineapple mango. Okay, yeah. Uh, that's really just a delightful, delightful meat. Uh, so those are a couple things coming out uh, at our, you know, again, the, the barrel aged traditional is something we try to rotate through regularly. It's tequila barrel, it's bourbon barrel, it's whiskey barrel, it's those types oh, of things. I love but, that. Uh, but, the pine, but the pine go is also very exciting. It's a completely and totally new product. For us. That's really cool. So you're in Boulder, Colorado, and do you guys do any, I know you have a tasting room. Do you do any tours at this point? Obviously, COVID has created a problem. Right. I mean, we've been... Our, we, our tasting room is tasting room in name only and has been since uh, the middle of March of 2020. We actually are just starting to be coming back to looking at uh, opening the tasting room for tastings. Uh, probably more limited hours, uh, as I'm sure anybody who's trying to hire anybody out there. Mm -hmm. 
Hiring is very difficult. Getting personnel is very difficult right now. Uh, we always used to offer a tour. We're not going to bring the tour back initially um, just for, you know, just health reasons. We'll kind of see if it comes out. So our new formation as a company in, in our tasting room is still taking shape. Uh, it'll probably come out in stages. We started doing this. Okay, now we added that. Now we're starting to do more of this. Now we put that back in place. Um, I suspect it'll be somewhat different than it used to be after after 14 or 15 months of uh, just being to go only out of our tasting room. But you can also, you know, I said earlier at the beginning, uh, about 35 states we can direct ship. You can go to redstonemeadery.com, see where we can. And we do have product on the shelf in 28 uh, states outside of Colorado. So you okay. can find us in a lot of places. You can find all that information on, on the website as well uh, with at the where to find tab. Uh, also lists our distributors name and phone number in each of those states. So you can do it one of two ways. You can always call the distributor and be like, hey, I live here. Where's the closest place I can find Redstone? Also helps us out a lot if you go into the store, ask for the beer or the wine buyer and be like, hey, I want to get Redstone Meadery. Here, here's who carries it uh, and you buy it from and the stores can bring it in. Too. That's yeah. And I'll be putting the information for the website and everything I can down below um, for anyone who wants to connect with Redstone. And uh, I think it's important that we support our meteries and especially in a time where COVID has, has been a, a struggle, something for many people. And it, the best thing we can do is, uh, make more mead and buy more mead at this point. No, we appreciate the sport. It was a trying year for everybody, and we obviously always wish people well. And we've had great support from 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 our, our customers, uh, keeping us uh, alive and kicking. Absolutely. So if you're in Boulder, and hopefully COVID is is gone sooner than later, um, go check out Redstone Meadery. Um, David, thank you so much for your time. I know that uh, it's it's a Thursday as we're recording this, so that week. The, the week is almost over, so I'm sure that you're you're ready to get your Friday going and, and get on to the weekend. So Yeah, I appreciate you taking the time to, to chat with me, and it was a lot of fun. This has been a blast, and of course, check out all the information below for any Redstone information that you want. Um, I have enjoyed this chat, and I hope you uh, everyone has as well. Um, check out every link you can, and support Redstone with all your money. <laughs> so There you go. So, so uh, hey. to, to all your viewers, and I appreciate you know appreciate you taking time. Uh, get out our way, come on and see us. But most importantly, stay healthy and stay well. Absolutely. Well, thanks for your time. Cheers. Take care.